Hello, everyone. Um, I think we can get started. It's about 10.05 uh, here out on the West Coast and should be around 1.05 on the East Coast. So again, good morning to everyone on the West Coast and good afternoon on the East Coast. Today we will present a little webinar about the performance of CLT connections under dynamic loading. My name is Max Klosen. Uh, my background is timber engineering with an education uh, on the craftsmanship side in Germany and timber framing, also university education in timber engineering from Germany. And then about 10 years ago, uh, when I came here to Canada, I studied timber engineering at UBC. And today we are involved in uh, timber connection technologies and are one of the timber connection system supplier to the North American mass timber industry. We want to provide a quick outlook here on what the webinar is going to contain. We will do a refresher on the performance of CLT connections under static loading. We will do the performance of CLT connections under cyclic loading, which is the main part of this webinar. And then at the end, we'll present a summary about design procedures, design values, comparison between static and dynamic loading, and so on. Every one of you should be able to send questions through the chat option of GoToWebinar. Um, we will answer these questions at the end of the webinar. The first testing campaign, which was presented in an earlier webinar 2015, was on static loading of CLT connections. We have looked at panel-to-panel -panel connections, such as surface spline, half lap, and butt joints. In the webinar today, we address the cyclic performance of these connections, again, panel-to-panel -panel connections, such as surface spline, half lap, butt joints. And then towards the end of the webinar, we'll present you the data and results um, that were obtained from the testing, some of the statistics, uh, typical failure modes, and some comparison of testing data or test values against design predictions. As usual, this webinar or the material presented in this webinar is for informational purpose. This is due to the fact that we only have done small test series. Small test series means six or three uh, repetitions, six uh, replicates in the static testing and three in dynamic testing. Overall, we still believe that even a small test series like that with around nine total specimen per series gives us uh, a good verification of existing or future code provisions on CLT connections because we do know there's a lot of, of new engineers already designing CLT structures without having much guidelines. So having some guideline or some test results is always a big benefit and can reassure our design procedures and make us feel comfortable with it. Here's uh, some initial introduction to the uh, connection systems and how they look like. On the left-hand side here, we see the surface spline CLT joint, then a half lap joint with a variety of fastener layouts, and to the right, the typical butt joint. Again, surface spline joints were tested, half lap joints and the typical butt joint. We have looked at a variety of different fastener layouts. Fastener layout here means we have changed the screw in angle to the shear plane or to the face of the CLT panel. We used 90 degree screwing angles, 45 degree screwing angles, and interestingly, 45 and 90 degree screwing angles as a combination to provide a certain uh, connection performance. And we have also used 33 and 45 degree combinations to achieve high stiffness and high capacity connections. We also used a variety of different fasteners per shear plane, um, eight fasteners per shear plane, 12, 10, and so on to investigate group effect actions. And we have also looked at uh, a variety of different applications, such as shear applications, withdrawal applications of the fasteners, and combined applications of the fasteners. All tests were done in Crosslam CLT panels, which is the V2M1 grade from a local manufacturer here in BC. The test setup for static loading was performed following this DIN standard 26819. It's basically pushing down the specimen on a slight 15 degree angle, basically. That helps us subject the fastener to a plain shear load. 
the loading procedure is displayed here in this load displacement chart. We basically load up the specimen to around 40% of its expected maximum load. We release the load to about 10% of ex its expected load and then we pick up the load again and do a destructive test on the specimen. Failure modes that were observed for the surface spline connections are basically displayed here. We see fastener yielding, head pull in, lots of wood crushing, tear out and so on, and also some out of plane rotation here to the right hand side towards the ultimate state of the specimen. The half lap joints where we used fasteners in withdrawal and shear or only fasteners in withdrawal or only in shear had failure modes such as had push in, had pull out, of course fastener yielding, wood crushing and so on. Typical head pull in is shown here and push out failure for the compression screw and here the tension screw is, is, is indicated here. Also on the combined or, or compound angle specimen where we have 30 degree and 45 degree screw in angles at the same time, we have seen some out of plane rotation. The results of all the static tests are presented in this particular table here. There's lots of numbers in this table which we will not go through in this uh, short presentation here. However, you will be sent um, a PDF version of the slides, I think on Monday or Friday this week, um, Monday next week, Friday this week. However, anyway, you will, you will receive a PDF copy of the slides um, where you can take a close look to these results. And if you have questions on the results, we're always happy to help answer these. What we want to point out is that there was testing done on specimen with no friction, that's the NF, and specimen with friction. No friction is basically there was an anti-friction membrane placed in the shear plane of the specimen and then tested. The anti-friction membrane, as it already the name implies, is supposed to eliminate friction and indicate if the friction in the connection has a, a, an impact on the connection performance. What we do see here in our results is that the impact of friction is fairly small throughout the entire test series. Here we have one of the displacement curves for static loading. The lower curve here is basically the curves with friction and without friction for the CLT surface spline, a three-ply CLT panel with a three-quarter inch standard uh, plywood surface spline. We do not see any differences here really in the performance. The same applies to the half lap joint, which we see here. This is the half lap joint load displacement curves for uh, specimen with friction and without friction. Here in the next chart, <clears throat> we see the impact of changing the fastener from a pure shear application to a tension application. Here the fasteners are driven in on 45 degree angles to the shear plane, subjecting the fastener to a tension load, we see that the system performs much, much stiffer and gives us a lot less ductility overall. On this slide, we demonstrate one of the new test setups. The new test setups or the new layouts basically combine 45 and 90 degree screws in our specimen. So this is basically here the 90 degree screws, screws acting in plane shear and then 45 degree screws, screws acting in tension. What we see here is that the specimen perform stiff and, and, and a very steep capacity increase in the initial phase of the test and then as soon as we see some sort of failure we get plastic deformation of our shear screws which, which yield us um, about 25 millimeters, just about one inch of deformation overall. In a summary, this basically looks like what we see here. What we want to point out is that the stiffness evaluation has taken place at 10 to 40 percent of the expected maximum load. So we take the range of the load displacement curve between 10 and 40 percent to determine the stiffness value K point, uh, 0 0.4. Those stiffness values are presented here. For design, we may want to select 0.7 or 0.9, depending on what we do. So this is just a, a design evaluation or a stiffness evaluation that we have selected for our data analysis here. We do, however, have the original test data. And if you were to select or if you want to select a stiffness setup between 10 and 90 percent of the connection, we would be able to provide that to you too on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Overall, what we see is that the specimen with a combined fastener layout with 45 and 90 degree screws in a different setup here with W basically is a withdrawal fastener first, a shear screw, another shear screw, and then another withdrawal fastener. We get the most or the best performance out of it. We have fairly high stiffness, high capacity, but do also get very high ductility values overall. <clears throat> In the next slide, we show the five-ply specimens. So we have done the testing on the, the common three-ply panels, which are about uh, 100 millimeters thick, uh, four inches, or the uh, five-ply panels, which is, are around 170 millimeters thick. In five-ply panels, what we see, if we compare those, we see higher capacities, obviously, compared to the three-ply specimen. Here again, we want to highlight the different performances as a, a summary for the static load displacement curves. So what we see here is the typical performance of a fastener in pure shear action driven in perpendicular to the shear force. On this side, we see the tension performance of a fastener. So basically a fully threaded wood screw driven in on a 45 degree angle to the direction of the shear plane. <clears throat> In the green curve here, we see the combined action. Combined is shear fasteners and tension fasteners in the same specimen, such as we see here to our right-hand side in the picture. Comparison between three and five ply is shown here. So the red curves are showing the performances or load displacement curves of the five ply specimen compared to the three ply specimen. Overall, we expect five ply specimen with more fastener embedment basically to give us higher capacities, which is what we see here in those charts. Comparison between three ply and five ply, um, some of the statistics are shown in this particular table. We can see the, the difference of maximum uh, capacity F max per fastener. So we do have a consistent increase uh, or strong consistent increase of the maximum fastener uh, force per fastener in between three and five ply. However, strangely, we do see a decrease in stiffness. We have some ideas on how to explain this. However, we have to verify this with a little bit more testing before we make uh, statements on this. What we, however, do see is that five ply panels somehow yield lower stiffnesses compared to the three ply panels, even though we get higher capacities and have more embedment of the fasteners. Comparison ultimately between predicted design values and our um, actual measured values. We have fairly high overstrength factors for all of these systems. Anything that is between two and four would be considered as reasonable. So anything we see here is reasonable in terms of overstrength factors and suggests that the design procedures is somewhat accurate. Anything that is in the range of more than four, in particular this uh, test setup here, that may need some adjustment in the testing procedures. The procedure overall is conservative. However, we do lose uh, some of the efficiency. And this is what we basically highlight here in the bottom chart. Um, the green bar is our static test result and the, the gray bar is the static uh, design prediction. So we can see we are always much, much lower than our actual test value. However, when we get into these ranges here, we, we become so inefficient that we, that we lose cost competitiveness overall. Now, after the quick 10, 12 minute uh, recap on the static testing, we want to move into the cyclic testing evaluation of the CLT connections. So we have used the standard Kuri loading procedure, which we see here. So we load the specimen with a cyclic loading back and forth. Um, and try to investigate the performance of our systems under that particular load. The selected test setup has one problem. It works well in compression. However, if we pull on our specimen, we are creating a prying force that pries the specimen apart, and that needs to be considered in design. We have not done that in our design predictions. However, we will do some verification and verification testing on this and see what the actual impact of this horizontal force is. So this will be presented in some of the later uh, webinars uh, this year. 
Again, we have selected the most appropriate systems, surface ply and half lap butt joints with a variety of fastener layouts, a different amount of screws per specimen, depending on spacing and, and edge distance requirements. And we have also looked into shear withdrawal and combined applications of shear and withdrawal fasteners. Surface spline joints is the first test setup that we want to present. The surface spline is basically a three-ply CLT panel in this case that has routed out a section here to receive a three-quarter inch plywood spline. We have used 5 sixteenths or 8 millimeter by 80 millimeter uh, wood screws with 50 millimeters of thread lengths to screw these pieces together. Those fasteners are CCMC and ICC approved, so they can be used as a standard system in, in Canadian and US design. Here we see the first load displacement curve of our system. Important here to point out is that the gray curve is the static load displacement curve. The green curves are obviously, obviously the cyclic curves. What we have done in the negative load section here, we have basically mirrored the positive load displacement curve into the negative area to have somewhat of a reference to the negative cycle here. It is definitely not 100% accurate. However, it is only meant to provide a little bit of a reference to see how much difference we get in positive and negative load cycles. If you want to look at this closer, you can, however, always uh, take a look at the tables, which we'll present a little bit later, where we indicate what the exact loads in positive and negative load cycles were. We have also created backbone curves for all test setups. So the backbone curve is shown here against the static loading curve. What we do see here is that we have quite significant drop in capacity between the static loading and the cyclic loading. This is somewhat expected as typically we would expect to see smaller forces or smaller resistances in the cyclic curves due to the damage that occurs with the cyclic loading. Failure modes are presented in the next slide. So what we see here is the impact of the prying force. So in the very ultimate stages of the testing, our prying force pulls the specimens entirely apart. We do see out of plane rotation. We do see fastener breakage in the ultimate stages of the connection, which is shown here. So these fasteners basically experience low cycle fatigue. They are case hardened fasteners with a high bending yield strength and if you subject them to 10, 15 or 20 load cycles or whatever we had used in the cyclic testing at one point they experience the fatigue and will fail uh, ultimately. We do also see significant wood crushing uh, and bending of the fasteners before failure. The half lapped joints which we see here have used uh, standard 516s, uh, 8 millimeter by 90 millimeter screws with 60 millimeters of thread. These are also standard fasteners that you can get and they fit nicely into the uh, three ply panels and almost provide full embedment throughout the entire panel. In terms of load displacement, we see this particular performance in the Initial starts of the static and the cyclic testing, we do not see a big difference between the two connection layouts or the two, two, two testing setups. Static and dynamic loading seem to perform equivalent in this load cycle. There is a slight difference in the negative load cycle here. However, overall in the range where we would design, which is somewhere around one kilonewton here of design load, we have very similar performances and then a large overstrength factors, which was about 25 millimeters or one inch of ultimate displacement in our connection. Backbone curve demonstrates that similarly, all we basically have is a capacity drop in the very ultimate stages of the system. This is way past our typical design process and would be considered ultimate failure of the connection already after a significant loading event. The overall connection behavior is shown in, in those 
pictures here. So again, we create a gap here due to the prying force. We create out of plane rotation of our specimen in the ultimate stages. And we also create a significant amount of yielding of our fasteners. What we nicely see here is that the fastener has formed a cavity. Initially, it was probably located in this particular area and then it was rocked back and forth in the positive and negative cycle and has created this, this significant wood crushing here and big cavity in the wood here where the wood is crushed and failed due to the cyclic loading. I can also see here that some of the wood fiber is torn out uh, due to withdrawal of the fastener in the, in the system. And what we see here on the right hand side is that the fasteners have significantly bent over to almost a 45 degree. This is one of the requirements the European manufacturers have. These fasteners are made in Germany, for instance. So they basically are required to deform by 45 degree without breakage, which gives us uh, an advantage here in the in the cyclic testing because we can bend the fastener and get a lot of deformation out of our system um, compared to what we would get with fasteners that are not made under the European standards. The next test setup we show is the half lap joint. So again, it's a regular half lap in a three ply panel. However, what we have done here now is use fully threaded screws in eight millimeter by 140 millimeter lengths, driven in on 45 degree angles in pairs of screws here. So 45 degree in one direction, 45 degree in the other direction, that basically gives us one tension and one compression screw. Fully sided screws, for the ones that do not know this yet, they are basically uh, similar to a threaded rod. They have threads from the very tip all the way to the very head and that's why they are called fully threaded. So there's no smooth shank on these fasteners anymore. The advantage of that is that we get heavy engagement of threads in both main and side member and increase connection capacities if they are applied in tension. A typical load displacement curve of this connection is indicated here. We see a very rigid, stiff um, performance up to around seven kilonewton per screw and then our screw starts or connection starts failing with about I would say 12 to 19 millimeters of displacement ultimately so we do have a fairly stiff connection with some ductility in it however this ductility is not much what we do should consider is that we are likely designing somewhere down here in the one and a half kilonewton range with our design load. So we have a quite significant overstrength factor on these systems anyway. The comparison against the backbone curve basically confirms what we already heard. We have a similar performance in the initial ranges and then our connection tapers off a little bit in terms of performance. It gets weaker under the cyclic loading. Overall failure modes of this connection are very similar to what we already saw. We do see fastener push out and a significant amount of fiber being pushed out. Imagine that the fastener was driven in at 45 degrees in this direction, so it was bearing here and now it has moved to another almost 90 degree uh, angle here. So it has moved by 45 degrees up, has torn out wood fiber, crushed wood fiber and dissipated energy while it was doing this. Also, we see the typical head pull-in failure and head push-out failures in our specimen. A more or a newer and more interesting application of the fasteners is when we use them in combined action. So we basically have stiff, rigid, high-capacity tension screws at the outside of the connection and then shear fasteners at the inside of the connection. This connection setup is intended to provide uh, high capacity, high stiffness and ductility to our system. A little video of the test um, we want to show here. I hope this video is running now for you. I believe there's a little bit of a time lag with the video due to the uh, broadcasting and internet connections. However, we can nicely see how the connection deforms. In our video here, it deforms nicely in this area. We pull it up and now we can see the action of the prying force. We slightly move the specimen out and pull it away from the other one. Fasteners are 
pushed out and pulled in. We will zoom in on this for you so you see how the fasteners move in and move out due to the cyclic loading. Here we can again see a lot of torn out wood fiber and how the fastener pushes back out. The typical load displacement curve of this setup is what we see here. We can definitely see a fairly reasonable linear increase in the initial um, section of the testing for the static load, also for the dynamic load. We do see that we have a nice amount of ductility with almost 40 to 50 millimeters of displacement while we are maintaining about two and a half times the load that we design at, which would be at around one and a half kilonewtons here. The backbone curve indicates the same already. So we do see uh, a significant drop in connection capacity between static and cyclic loading. In the initial ranges, we again have very similar performances in positive and negative cycles. Failure modes we see for these systems are again a large amount of displacement, typical fastener head push out and head pull in. What we see here, wood fiber is being damaged and torn out. When we cut the specimen open after the testing, we can see a lot of torn out wood fiber. We can see a lot of bending of the fasteners and pull out failures of the tension screws. In the next setup, we have changed the fastener layout now. In the initial setup, we had these tension screws on the outside of the specimen. So if we imagine that we are applying a load in this direction, we had the tension fasteners located here in the previous setup and then shear fasteners and then tension fasteners. Now we have this the exact opposite way around. We have load application here. We have shear fasteners towards the load application and then tension fasteners in the center in a combination with shear fasteners. This is basically done to see the difference of fastener layout and if the fastener layout has an impact on our connection performance. Taking a look at the load displacement curves, we can clearly see that we do have an impact of this. We see the static loading curve being much closer to the dynamic loading curve. It is very similar in positive and not negative load cycles in the initial range before we achieve um, failure of the connection in, in a more uh, plastic permanent deformation. Looking at the backbone curve, we see similar uh, things that we saw before. We have a slight load drop in between static and dynamic performances. However, it is quite different to what we have seen before. The specimen before, we had a very significant drop between static and loading, static and dynamic loading. And here in this particular fastener setup, fastener layout, we only have a small difference. Again, this system here is what we see up to the top left, and the system here at the bottom is what we see to the to the bottom right. So here we see tension screws to the outside, tension screws to the inside of the specimen. The overall connection behavior is again, as we already expect, fastener pull in, push out, tearing out of wood fiber and yielding of the system, just like we also get this prying, significant prying of the specimen here where we pull the specimen apart. The next setup is a compound angle. So we have fasteners driven in at 45 and 30 degrees. Um, how this works is what we see down here. So we have a 30 degree angle between the fastener axis and the surface of the spline at the surface of the CLT and a 45 degree angle between a imaginary horizontal line this way and the fastener that way. One other important factor that we want to mention here, like these systems would be able to take a load out of plane. So if we have panels that need to take out of plane loading, we would basically subject our fastness here into a tension force again, and we are able to take some out of plane 
loading, how much that is. We have not looked into it. There's only a small test series done on this yet, but no significant comparison that we would like to uh, address in this webinar. The load displacement curves are basically what we see here. We have a very stiff performance of the entire system, pretty much all the way to failure. And then we get about 12 millimeters or half inch, three quarter inch of displacement before our connection ultimately fails and drops uh, load significantly. Again, the sign level of the system would be somewhere in this area. So even at failure around 20 millimeters of displacement, we have about a safety factor of two um, into our design uh, level. The backbone curve reassures us what we already saw. We see very similar performance between static and dynamic loading. And in conclusion, we can say that for this particular connection setup, we, we may not see a difference between static and dynamic loading for what we have tested here. Failure modes ultimately look like we see here. <clears throat> we get heavy pulling apart of the specimen and out of plane rotation. We do also get significant uh, screw yielding and failure of the fasteners. So this screw should have been still straight like that. However, now it basically tapers off in this direction. This one here has bent like this. So we see a lot of metal yielding and steel yielding in our connection system. What we also see is that some of the fasteners have pulled out and torn a lot of wood fiber out and crushed a lot of wood fiber overall in the performance or testing of the system. The stiffness and ductility of the system can be evaluated as well. I would say we have a very stiff connection initially that is still allowing us to deform about 20 millimeters ultimately before we experience significant drops in terms of load. This is why we say the connection has a somewhat good ductility. It is a stiff connection that still allows us to deform about 20 millimeters before dropping significantly in load. The next setup is a standard butt joint system. Butt joints are not so commonly used yet due to a few reasons. There is tolerance issues. Likely we can get smoke penetration or fire penetration through that um, uh, joint here if it's not sealed tightly. However, we can get joint sealing tapes or what the zip panel industry is using, just tapes at the bottom if we are not exposing our panels architecturally. And then this connection here becomes a very cost competitive system because we do get a nice performance, which we see in the next slide. And we can also uh, reduce the machining cost of the CLT panels as we do not have to route our house anything in. We just basically do a straight cut and then join our panels. The nice performance is what we see in this chart. We can see a very kind of high capacity system. It gains capacity while it deforms and then it maintains the capacity uh, for about the 20 millimeters of displacement in our system. For designing the system, we are designing around one kilonewton, 0.8 kilonewton down here. So we have significant overstrength factors, which as mentioned before, are not always good. They may actually be too conservative. Here we have shown the backbone curve against the static load displacement curve again. Interestingly, in this particular setup, we see a capacity gain in our cyclic testing. So this is something that we would not typically expect. The reasons for that are not investigated yet properly. We will have to closely look at the failure modes and test data to determine why this actually happens. We do have some ideas which we will present in the, in the later summaries of this um, webinar. Failure modes are as expected again. We do see prying part of the specimen. We do see um, head pull-in failures, uh, which is down here. We see significant yielding of the fastener. So please imagine that the fasteners initially were located in this direction. And now after the testing, they are pointing this direction. So we again have about a 45 degree angle um, 
that the fastener has deformed throughout the testing. And this might be one of the reasons why we see these significant pack capacities. So if we basically have a fastener in plain shear action, we would see around 0.8 kilonewton of capacity per fastener. And now we bend the fastener over and use them in a 45 degree angle, so a tension application. Here we would expect around two or two and a half kilonewton per fasteners. And if we, if we look at this assumption, we can pretty much already verify that these tension or rope effects are uh, very, uh, very much real in, in these particular connection setups. Ultimately, again, due to low cycle fatigue, out of those eight fasteners in this particular specimen, we have seen one ultimate failure of the screw here, uh, failing in, in, in a breaking fashion. So it basically breaks off entirely. It breaks off in the shear plane um, where, the, where the force is actually acted. We can again see head, pull, uh, head push out, head pull in, push out on this side, and also a significant amount of cavity forming here in the, in the layers of the CLT, crushing a lot of wood fiber and tearing a lot of wood fiber out. For the next few slides, what we want to do is show each single backbone curve against the next specimen. So what we see here is the backbone curve of the series surface spline in a three ply panel with a half inch or three, I think it was a three quarter inch surface spline. So we see the ultimate performance of the system under cyclic loading. A change from a surface spline to a half lap joint is what we see here now. So we see a much stiffer and much higher capacity performance overall when we change from a surface spline to a half lap joint. So depending on what we are designing, we can definitely select the system to perform as we want it to perform at high capacity, high ductility, and so on. If we are looking for a rigid diaphragm assumption, for instance, where the, the CLT panels are basically rigidly connected, then we would probably want to go to one of the 45 degree layouts. We have, first of all, we exceed by far the capacity of the surface spline. We exceed by far the capacity of the half lap joint, at least in the, in the linear ranges here. And we have a, a high capacity stiff connection that would not deform a lot in our rigid diaphragm. For the series where we use combined fasteners, we would kind of get the ideal scenario of two worlds for the performance in our building. We basically have a very predictable stiff performance of the CLT system. As soon as we subject it to um, a heavy loading event like an earthquake, we would still be able to yield this connection significantly and ensure that we get large deformations, energy dissipations, yielding, and so on of our systems in the major loading event. The next setup is the um, opposite system. So again, the system before had tension fasteners on the outside, and now we have the tension fasteners on the inside. We again see an intermediate performance here with less displacement. However, ultimately very similar performances in the fasteners, in the, fa in the range here where fasteners act in tension. And then as soon as we fail some of the tension fasteners, we go into a slightly different shape here with the yielding and engaging of shear fasteners. The combined system where we use compound angles with 45 and 33 degree and full thread wood screws, we see the highest capacities. We have about 10 millimeters, uh, 12 millimeters of displacement here in the stages before we see a significant load drop and then displacements of up to 20 millimeters in the system. So this is the, the, the stiffest connection that we have, performs with a very high capacity and high stiffness overall, and then a respective uh, small um, ductility um, compared to the other systems. A very nice performance ultimately also for the butt joints with 45 degree full thread screws. So again, these fasteners are driven in on 45 degree angles to the surface of the CLT panel and a 90 degree angle to the shear force. So they are acting in plain shear in the linear ranges and then they will pick up some load and withdrawal towards the, the ultimate stages of the specimen as soon as it um, deforms basically. The previously mentioned tables on all the positive and negative load cycle results are presented here. 
So there's again a lot of numbers in these tables which we will not address in detail. However, what we want to point out is that you will find the maximum connection force, the force per fastener, the yield force per fastener, the maximum displacement of the connection, the yield displacement of the connection and then a ductility estimate of the system. And we've also shown and indicated the stiffnesses between 10 and 90% of the yield load and 10 and 40% of the load respectively. In the negative load cycle overall, we see smaller capacities as we have mentioned already. So this is just uh, one measure to make sure that we have positive and not negative load cycle, understand what's going on in both load cycles, and then ultimately average out the system uh, between positive and negative load cycles. And this is very much what we see in this table. We have presented the same results in this table and we can have a look at these uh, in a quiet minute when we are designing structures and need verification for our design procedures. Overall, summarizing this in a more graphical fashion, we have positive and negative load cycles. Positive load cycle seems always a little bit stronger than a negative load cycle. Um, we would assume that this is normal. Uh, however, we have to do some verification testing here because we created a prying force, an additional force component in one of the cycles here that we want to verify. In terms of cost, Cost is always an issue for everything. So we have done a, a brief cost analysis here. This is the cost per fastener basically at uh, design load level. So a cost per kilonewton at design load level for the uh, self-tapping wood screws. Seems that there are some systems that are cheaper than others. However, this is not considering the manufacturing cost. This is why we think the, the last series, series number seven, which was the butt joint system, is uh, probably off the chart here a little bit. It is the cheapest one to manufacture likely, uh, could be the cheapest one to install likely, and uh, still seems to be the, the most expensive one that we, uh, that we have here. This is due to the fact that we have the largest overstrength factor of around 10, almost nine or 10 in our system. We will show that in the table uh, in a few slides anyway. But here for this one, we would like to work with a CLT manufacturer and really figure out which system is the most cost efficient um, for fastener selection and CLT manufacturing um, to, to develop a, a low cost option for instance for industrial buildings where architectural appearance is not as significant. Load displacement curves, again, a quick summary here. So static loading has this kind of load setup, dynamic loading, the cyclic loading. What we want to go into now before we wrap up the presentation in around five minutes, we have a comparison between the static loading results and the uh, cyclic loading results. We do see a capacity reduction overall for the maximum force between uh, cyclic and static loading of around 30% to 7% depending on the layout. We do also see uh, the yield force being impacted by the dynamic loading, which is pretty much what we expect. We do also see um, ductility drops in all specimen pretty much. Uh, there's a big variety here of around 60% to 6%. So we see factors of 10 here, depending on which connection layout we select. Also, we do see a drop in stiffness, uh, significant drops um, for some connections, in particular for the 45 degree tension screws, we see significant drops and then less significant drops for fasteners in shear of the uh, butt joint here at the very bottom. A comparison between cyclic test and static test data we again want to display this in a more graphical fashion here at the bottom under the table. So we see that all our systems perform pretty conservative with static design predictions and static um, test results. We do also see um, quite nice safety factors here if we compare the dynamic performance against our, against our static design procedure. So anything that is between two and four should be considered as at least reasonable. 
um, for some of these joints here, this, the small overstrength ratios might be due to the small test series or because we have selected a variety of adjustment factors to compute these values. Again, the overstrength factor for the butt joint seems very high at eight. There might be some suggestions on how to improve the performance of these systems or the performance or the accuracy of the design calculation. In conclusion, we basically see that tests indicate ductile performance with self-tapping screws and shear action. We do also see a more brittle performance of our withdrawal screws with much higher stiffnesses and ultimate capacities compared to the standard shear connections. We do also see that tests indicate a very moderate or nice performance on all our specimens where we have used fastness and shear and tension. We do get high stiffness in the initial phase, which is a linear increase here, very predictable. And then we have a nice long um, ductile performance. We maintain the load while we gain deformation in our system, which is a nice performance of these connections. Then we also saw that cyclic and uh, static testing has a, a pretty a big capacity difference and some systems experience differences in stiffness as well. Capacity drops are expected, stiffness drops are expected when we subject the system to a cyclic load. Then further, our tests have indicated that the butt joint seems like a very good option for our system due to the potential low CLT manufacturing cost. Again, this would have to be uh, confirmed by a CLT manufacturer. Um, if you have an idea on, on the manufacturing cost, we'd be happy to uh, take a phone call with you and, and find the most cost-efficient CLT connection for, for bidding processes and to, to be more cost-competitive against steel or concrete buildings overall. In addition, we saw that our butt joints with the combined fastness have or exhibit a high stiffness while maintaining about 20 millimeters of displacement in the system. So this doesn't seem like a bad option overall. Um, a little bit of testing on site probably has to be done on finding out if the fastener insertion and so on is cost effective. It works in the lab. If it works on site, uh, we will not know until we try it. What works in lab does not necessarily work on site all the time. Also, we have basically seen that all the design procedures that we have tried to, to use for design comparison here, which are basically taken from the uh, American Wood Council uh, CLT design guide or the uh, Canadian CLT design guide or the CSA OD6 or the National Design Standard in the US, we see overall conservativeness for the uh, existing connection systems. Some are more conservative than others and some are more accurate than others, however. A quick outlook on what is going to follow in the next few months. Uh, we're planning to host one more uh, webinar uh, about uh, other test series that we have conducted in the summer. So we will get an application, out, uh, an invitation out to you as soon as this webinar is ready. It will likely be on the performance of other systems, CLTs or heavy timber connection systems again. For the outlook, uh, we want to investigate group action factors of these systems because the research that we have done now is not conclusive. We also want to confirm the dynamic testing procedures and address the perpendicular uh, force component that we have created. We also want to look into the butt joint performances uh, with differences between fully threaded and partially threaded screws. One option would be to look at the European design equation, which is displayed here. So here the RK values basically be determined the dowel, like compute through the dowel failure modes or uh, Johansson yield tree of our system with adjustment factors here, the bending yield strengths, basically the embedment strengths and the fastener diameter. Plus we are allowed to use a certain delta RK factor, which is pretty much 25% of the withdrawal resistance of the fastener is considered for the shear resistance. This would get us in particular for the butt joints where we have this setup. We would probably get much, much closer with our design predictions to a real uh, nice overstrength factor of about two to four maybe. 
Also, we want to do some medium scale testing on 4x8 CLT panels. This is under investigation already and will be performed this summer. So this will be one of the uh, interesting things to see how the system performs, how these connection, connections perform in a, in a more system-like fashion so that we can use it for shear walls and large diaphragm design. Also important to investigate is the fastener diameter. Self-tapping wood screws are available in quarter inch, uh, 5 16 3 8 half inch diameters and so on. So we would like to figure out which fastener is the most cost efficient for our design. As usual, we want to thank the researchers and students that have been working on these projects without the support of the universities, in particular Dr. Thomas Tannert. This would not be possible. Um, very grateful for the support at UBC here and the students, uh, Afrin Hossen, a PhD student at the University of BC that is looking into the performance of CLT connection systems for us. Without the support of the universities, we would not have any verification of these tests and our products. Now we have summarized this webinar on time. We're planning to do 50 minutes. Um, we are at 51 minutes now. I would like to thank you for your attention uh, and hope you will have uh, a good day and then a good weekend. We also want to uh, address one urgent issue. We are currently looking for junior uh, engineers. So if there's any students uh, attending this webinar, we would be interested in receiving an application for you for a junior position. Um, fresh out of school, if possible, to do more research and more investigations on timber connection systems for the North American market. Thank you very much all for attending, and I think we can take some questions now. Oh boy, there's a whole bunch of questions here. <clears throat> Let me quickly read through some of these questions. There's one question that asks for if, stat if cyclic loading showed increased capacity against static testing. So yes, we saw this on some of the systems. I believe the butt joint was the case and the um, compound angle system yielded higher capacities in the static, uh, in the cyclic loading compared to the static system. And there's one question on material ductility of screws. Um, pretty much the best ductility you would get with a non-hardened, like a mild steel fastener. However, a mild steel fastener will suffer a lot of reduction in bending yield strengths and will also likely not be able to resist the drive and torque. You will strip bits and strip the screw heads, so that's not an option. What we try to do with these fasteners that we have is we try to case harden them so they remain elastic on the outside, however stiff on the inside. That gives us a, a combination of a somewhat ductile performance of the system while maintaining a high torsional strength and a high strength um, bending yield strength. There is one question here, if it is possible to design these CLT systems for post-disaster buildings. I do believe um, that it is definitely possible. We basically need to create uh, additional safety factors for this. Um, I believe code provisions uh, probably show you that you need to increase the, the loads by a factor of two, for instance, on post-disaster buildings. And that will then make your connections uh, uh, much, much stronger, or they basically need more fasteners accordingly. And based on the performances that we see here with our testing, we do have uh, reasonable amounts of overstrengths and somewhat accurate design positions. So I believe we can definitely design post-disaster buildings with uh, CLTs and uh, respective fasteners. Also one question on a plywood biscuit joint. I assume this would mean an internal spline. Um, yes, we have tried that. This basically, if we have an internal spline, this subjects the fasteners to a double shear action. So we basically double the capacity with our system. The problem with this particular setup is tolerances on site. If we do it, if we do a miller groove into our CLT panel and then try to stick it onto a surface spline, uh, onto a, a, a internal spline, and it has rain and the plywood basically 
is swelling a little bit. We have tolerance problems in that. We need to provide a tight fit between the groove and the plywood spline. If we need to, if we can't do that, then the connection does not work as well. Um, we do believe it's a valid approach. However, the, the site tolerances and manufacturing tolerances are probably an, an issue for this. And if we consider we have, a say, a 40-foot three-ply panel, the panel is fairly soft and it would be hard to basically drop it with the grain with the crane on onto a, a internal spline. So that's probably one of the issues that we will see with that. There's one question on optimal wood um, species. Um, I believe there is no optimal wood species for CLT panels. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can use any softwood species that adheres to glue. There might be an issue with the gluing in hardwoods like oak um, due to the, the, the acids and so on that the timber species contain. Uh, what is commonly used for CLT is uh, spruce pine fir or, or some sort of pine uh, right now, but there's also uh, Douglas fir uh, layers that you can create. I believe this is about it that we have on questions that I can answer right away. So again, I would like to thank you for your attention and ultimately have a good day or afternoon on the East Coast and a good day on the West Coast. Thank you very much for joining and listening to this webinar. Thank you.